Good morning. It's good to be together to sing and celebrate how great our God is. Let's stand together and sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. I didn't get done visiting with everybody yet. Oh, man. Welcome. What a joy it is to be together in God's house. Oh, I look forward to uh, Sunday every week. Uh, a great Sunday to see all my friends and uh, see my brothers and sisters in Jesus and for us to gather around the Word of God and allow the Word of God to speak into our hearts and our lives. Man, oh, man, it didn't get any gooder than that, does it? Isn't that the good stuff? That's the good stuff. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Hey, as we gather and worship, uh, we are in a relationship series. Uh, in, in the Word last week, we looked at uh, what, what covenant friendship was like and what, uh, what were the strengths of relationships and how God made us relational and how we do that uh, in, in our community. And today we're going to talk about family relationships and being family. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, those who labor it, build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Family is a blessing from God. It's a reward from God. You're blessed of God. And it is God who establishes the family. We're going to talk about that today as we gather around the word. Let's pray together and commit our morning to him. God, you're a great God. You are mighty and good in what you do. And Father, we love you. And so, God, as we gather here, Father, we come with hungry hearts. We long to hear your truth. We want to uh, have a holy encounter with you, God. We want you to speak into our lives and reveal your truth to us that, God, we might conform our life to your word. This world is trying to fit us into its mold, but, God, we want to fit into the mold of your truth. For, Father, in your way is fullness of life. And, God, we long for fullness of life. Father, give us ears that are attentive. Give us hearts that are tender. And, Father... Uh, give us feet that are faithful and obedient to you. Father, we just commit these moments to you and pray that your Holy Spirit would appoint, anoint every element of our shared time in fellowship, in worship, in word. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm so thankful for his amazing grace. He is worthy of our worship and praise. Let's sing some hymns together. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we bring. 
to invite our children up front for children's message. Oh, 
Well, good morning, guys. I'm glad to see you. The, Pastor Paul told me that we were going to talk about what it means to be a family and, and the importance that God puts on the family. And so as a family of God, um, we come and gather and, and support one another and encourage one another because we all have to have different families. So I thought, well, let's look at the perfect family. Let's find the perfect family. God surely has a perfect family in his word. So I started looking in his word to find the perfect family. Children's sermon over. You guys can go back to your seats. Oh, no, 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 no. But that's what happened. There is no perfect family. That's because God has a plan for us to learn and grow from each other. And so the family I picked um, was Joseph's family. Are you ready for Joseph's family? This is what Joseph's family, you can find his story in Genesis, starting in chapter 37 of Joseph. And boy, does he have a story. He has 12 brothers. And they do not like him very well. And this is why, because their dad has picked Joseph as his favorite. And he has not only told him that he was going to be his chosen, his favorite one, but he has also given him a coat with many colors to wear to kind of brag about it in some ways. And so he goes wearing this coat in front of his brothers. And how do you think they feel? They don't feel very good about this at all. And then he starts having dreams um, where God is showing him that they are eventually going to bow down, to bow down to him. Can you imagine going home today and telling your brother or your sister, you know what, in a few years you're going to bow down to me. I'm going to be your ruler. Um, that would not go well for you. Don't try that, okay? This, this was, does not work. And it didn't work well for Joseph. In fact, um, they took him and threw him down a well, and then eventually um, his brother Reuben helped him. Um, they, he stopped them from killing him because they were, some of the brothers were ready to kill him. And so they so stopped that, sold him into slavery, and he went to go live at Potiphar's house, with, who was an official of Pharaoh. And Joseph started um, working with Potiphar and became very successful. Can you guys keep your hands yourself, please? Thank you. And, and help, it was becoming very, very successful and doing very well in Potiphar's house. And then a problem came. And with that problem, Joseph ended up in jail and had to spend time in jail. Oh, no. But so while he was in jail, then he, had, he interpreted some dreams of some guests who came to jail. And they told, he told them, now remember me when you get out. Because he told them they were going to get out. And sure enough, they got out. Did they remember him? No. He spent more time in jail. Then Pharaoh had a dream. And he needed it interpreted. So somebody told him, oh, yeah, there's that, there's that Joseph guy. Go talk to Joseph. And so they pulled Joseph out of prison. And he, with God's help, he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh was impressed. In fact, Pharaoh made him second in command. And kind of a lot like Daniel, didn't it? But, but that was before Daniel. And he put him in command. And he was in charge. And the dream that he interpreted was to tell him it was a warning from God to say, hey, there's a famine coming. Oh, no, what's a famine? Well, you don't get any food during a famine, or it's really hard to find food. It's hard to grow crops because there's no rain to water the crops. And so Joseph knew there was coming five years where it was going to be good, and then there was going to be a famine. So he got Egypt ready and got them ready to be prepared so they would have plenty of food during this famine. Well, remember his brothers, because we're talking about family. His brothers um, were living in, the other, in his homeland, and, and they, they ran out of food, and they needed help. And they heard about Egypt and how they had enough food. So they, um, their father sent them to go and ask for food. And guess who they met? Their brother Joseph. But they didn't know it was him. It had been a long time since they had seen him. And he was probably dressed in Egyptian garb of some, si some type, or who knows what it was. But somehow they did not notice that it was their brother. And they asked him for food, and he put them to the test. And you'll have to read about that because we don't have all day to go through all of Joseph's story. So you notice I'm going really fast. Um, because then what happens is that after being put to the test, Joseph takes care of his family. They come and, and live near the, um, the land of Egypt. They, he takes care of them and provides for them through the famine. And then their father finally, at a very old age, gets sick, and it's time for him to die. And then he dies. And then as his, Joseph's father is, um, after he, Joseph's father dies, the brothers are scared because they thought, well, the only reason that Joseph's keeping us alive is because he doesn't want to look bad in front of dad. But now that dad's gone, we're going to die. 
So they went and begged for him. They begged. In fact, they even told a lie and said, I think our dad told you not to hurt us. Are you not going to hurt us? And Joseph said, don't worry. I'm here to help you. In fact, listen, listen, God has made a plan. In fact, let me read that scripture passage. It's in um, Genesis chapter 50, verse 29. And it says, this is what Joseph tells his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you. So did you hear what happened? Joseph saved his brothers. He saved the, the many people who could have died during the famine because God helped him each step of the way. Joseph could have said, I don't want to be a good guy. I'm going to make people pay. They threw me into slavery and, and all kinds of bad things happened in my life. But Joseph kept listening to God, kept following God, and Joseph was able to help his family. And his family was thankful for Joseph and for the, the things that he had provided. Joseph did great things for his family. So what can we learn from that today? Well, let me, let me look and make sure I, I don't want to mess up my list because there were some good things here. Family is important. God created family. And he put you in that family to help that family. So what is your role? You've got to ask God and find God. And we'll ask him in a minute. And we'll listen to God. And God will show you throughout your life how you can help your family. Maybe there's something special that God's planned for you. Maybe it's something even today. God has family, and he knows that it isn't easy to live in family, but it helps us to learn how to live together. Man, sometimes it's not easy to live with people. Do you know that parents get annoying? They tell us what to do, and they, and they are always bossy. Well, maybe not always, but sometimes. And it's hard to live with people. God knows that, and he wants us to learn to live with one another, and not only that, but to love and care for each other, even when it's hard. And so God helps us with that. And God wants us to grow our family, to be family with one another, and to be ones who encourage one another, so that when people try to do bad things, we can look for what God is doing and see what good God is going to do, even in the bad things, just like Joseph did for his brothers. Big task, so we better ask God what he has for us to do. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day, and I thank you for um, the, the life of Joseph that we can look in the Bible. And Lord, there's so many things we can learn, at, learn about, but today we want to learn about family. And so Lord, I pray that you would show us how we can be that brother, that son, that sister, um, that daughter that can be in our family doing what you've called us to do. Maybe we are the one who helps lead our family in prayer. Maybe we are the boy or girl that, that helps tell others about Jesus. Maybe we do all of these things. God, you may have great, and you, I know you have great and amazing things for us to do in our families. And then remind us we are also part of a church family. Help us to love each other and to care for others. There may be somebody who's here that's very lonely, that needs your, needs your love. Help us to express it this day. Help us to be family. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys were good listeners. You can get a piece of candy on your way back to your seat. God is amazing. I'm so thankful for the family that he puts together. Let's continue to celebrate him. Let's stand and sing, Hallelujah, your love is amazing. is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah. Love is a 
rising, I can feel it rising, all the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through, I can feel this God song rising up in me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. He is amazing. You may be seated. Our boys and girls, four-year-olds through first graders are dismissed for children's worship at this time. Oh, amen, amen. Let me invite you to turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to begin reading in verse 1 here in just a moment. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, I, I need a couple of volunteers. Thank you, Micah. Appreciate it. Hey, Keelan. Are you volunteering for me, brother? Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Come on down here. Come on, come on over here. Uh, I, I want uh, you two to do something for me, if you would. Be so kind. Uh, as uh, they come, they're going uh, to do something. And I apologize. Over here, you're not going to be able to see quite as well, but you'll kind of figure out as we go just exactly what's going on. If you'll come over here to the whiteboard, I'm, I'm going to ask Keelan, I'm going to ask you if you would be so kind uh, to, to draw 35 circles. And Micah, I want you to draw just a minute. I, I, I got the number here. Just a second. I need you to draw 32,850 circles. And when you're done, I want you to return to your seats, okay? Okay, so we're going to let them do that while we move on forward and move on in, uh, in the message. Uh, I want us to talk a little bit about family, and I want us to talk about fam uh, fam familial relationships and how God, uh, the kind of family God honors, and we're going to come back to that in a moment. Don't, don't let that distract you. We're going to talk about, a little bit about family. God is relational. We call Him Father. God is relational. He established family. God is a God of heritage. Uh, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Throughout all of Scripture, we find that He is a God of heritage, the heritage of family. God created family. He made Adam and Eve and told them to multiply and to fill the earth. He established family. God created family. Now, there's an interesting tension between uh, the reality of God's creating family and what we find in the New Testament because Jesus tells us that we're to leave father, mother, brother, sister for the sake of the gospel because there's one thing that trumps family and that is following Christ and following and honoring Him and that's, uh, that's primary in our lives. But God established family and in God's perfect world a family is something that encourages us. Thank you, Keelan. Appreciate it, brother. Uh, a family is something that encourages... How are you doing, Micah? You're not done. You're not done. Stay the course. All right, so 32,850 in case you forgot. Okay, so, so we're going to come back to that here in a moment. But God created family, and I'm thankful for a, a godly heritage. God's plan was that our families would be so, so precious, so tight, so dear, and so encouraging to us that it would further and nurture our walk with God. I am a... In, incredibly appreciative. I am incredibly thankful for the family that I grew up in. I grew up in a family, and, and, uh, and, and I apologize, but I'm going to tell you frankly some things about my family. Can I do that? Thank you. So when I was a child, when I was a kid, common practice in my household was if my mom got too close to my dad, he would slap her on the bottom and wrestled her in the recliner and they would kiss. And I was disgusted. I was just, oh, oh my goodness. And I was disgusted until in the sixth grade, I was over at my buddy's David Holling's house. David Holling. I was hanging out with David and we were playing and his mom and dad started screaming and yelling and calling each other names and throwing stuff. And I just was scared to death. I ran home. And I was glad. My mom and dad loved each other. It was a gift they gave us. 
we were, a, we were a holiday family when I was growing up. This is May Day, happy May Day. When I grew up, we did every holiday. Every holiday was a huge event at our household. And so all the way through high school, I made little baskets out of, out of wallpaper samplers and put violets in them with candy and dropped them off at all my buddies' houses. I dropped them off at all the football guys' houses and rang the bell and ran. <clears throat> I didn't realize they knew who it was because I was the only guy in my high school that did that in Valley High School, West Des Moines, Iowa. But... But it was May Day. It's what you do. I'm one of the few people, there is one other person in our congregation today who knows what it is to sing groundhog carols. Have you ever sung any groundhog carols? You don't celebrate Groundhog Day then, do you? And every holiday was a special event at our family. Mom made a special meal. We had a blowout evening as a family, and it was an incredible moment. I'm thankful for that family heritage. Often in the evenings, my dad would gather us all together and we'd be in the, in the living room and my dad would sit on the couch and he'd read out the Word of God to us. Read the Word of God to us. And then I'd watch my dad get down on his knee in front of the couch and he'd pray. And I heard him call my name to the Father. And he'd pray over me. He'd pray over my two sisters. Man, I'm thankful for the heritage I have. I'm thankful for the, the family that invested in my life. I'm grieved and sorrowed that everyone can experience that, and I know many of us in our fellowship here have experienced abuse, neglect, and rejection in our families. And that must stop today. For we will build a heritage of faithfulness. Here in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's a recounting or retelling of the law. It's called the second law. Uh, in Exodus 20, we have the Ten Commandments. You see it again in De Deuteronomy chapter 5. It, it, it's the second command. It's the, the second telling of the truths of God. It is full of solemn warnings and the recounting of the history and the principal laws of God. It, this text we're going to read today it speaks to us of what it means to be family. It talks to us about how we are generational in investing the truth and the wonder of God. He is speaking to a group of people who have grown up in the wilderness and so they don't remember all of those things that happened in Egypt. They don't remember the miracles of Egypt and so Moses is telling them you've got to tell and tell and retell and continue to tell the reality of the story so we remain focused. I read this week that the average child laughs 400 times a day. And the average adult laughs 15 times a day. What has happened where we lose the wonder of life? I think it's because we're disintegrating as family and we've got to welcome the wonder. Here in our text we receive counsel for such. So Deuteronomy, I'm sorry I turned somewhere else in my scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6 Follow along with me in verse 1. It says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Here in this text of Scripture, as he is addressing how we conduct ourselves in our houses, in our household, he sells, tells us, first of all, pay attention. You've got to hear, you've got to do, and you've got to remember. You've got to hear, you've got to do, and you remember. First, he says, you've got to hear. You doing okay, Micah? Good, 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 good. You've got to hear, you've got to do, you've got to remember. 
We need to hear the word of God. It's a statement here in verse 1. He says, I'm going to tell you the statutes and rules that God has commanded us. Verse 2, he says, we are to fear God. Verse 3, he says, the command is to, to hear, hear that it may go well with you. Hear that it may go well with you and hear that you may multiply greatly. You've got to hear. Hear, O Israel, is in verse 4. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. It's a call of challenge to perceive what is to follow. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel. There is no significant instruction, no benefit comes apart from our hearing truth. You've got to hear truth so you can receive truth and you can practice truth. It's a significant call we hear over and over in Scripture. Before he begins the formal telling of the law in chapter 4, he says, hear. In chapter 5, when he get, gives the Ten Commandments, he says, hear. And he gives the Ten Commandments. Here he gives the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He says, hear. This is the most significant prayer of the Jews here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That was recited by the Jews every day. Here, it's recorded for us in the book of Romans. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You've got to hear the word of God so they can be united with faith in your life and you can follow after Christ. It's a warning given to the churches in the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3 after he tells them what's going on in their, in their midst and what they need to do. He says, hear, hear, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Now, if we're going to grow, we've got to first... We've got to hear. You've got to hear the truth. You've got to hear the, from God. We've got to hear. But then not only do we have to hear, but then we have to do. We have to do the word. Here in our text, he says in verse 1, do them in the land to which you are going. You've got to do this in the land to which you are going. He, he says you've got to contextualize the word wherever you are. Wherever you go, wherever you are, in whatever situation, whatever job, uh, whatever circumstance you're in, you've got to contextualize the word of God in that setting. You've got to live out the word of God where you are, where you are. He says in verse 2, that you may keep it. Verse 3, hear and be careful to do. We must Listen, but then we've got to act. We've got to live out what God says because James says without faith, without works, faith is dead. Now God gives us his commands for our own benefit that we may live long and that may, we may find the life that he intended. That we may live long and find the life that he intended. So we've got to hear and then we've got to do and it's urgent that we remember these words I command you, he says, are to be on your heart. They are to be meditated on, reflected on, ruminated on. We've got to remember. We've got to be, have them on our heart. We've got to continually uh, allow them to, to percolate through our lives. He says, you shall teach them to your children diligently. They are to be talked about often in, the, in, in your household, in your life, in your daily converse, that you need to talk about them diligently to your children. We're to talk about them when we sit in our house, when we walk, when we lie down, when we rise up. You shall bind them, he says, before your eyes and write them on the gates and the posts of your house. He means to bind them, means to fasten, to remember them ever and always. We're to keep them ever and always before us. They were to keep the word of God ever and always before us. It need to be, needs to be memorized in our spirit, in our lives, so we can ruminate on the word of God. It can come to mind, it can come before us, and we can, can realize the truth of the word of God. Now, the Jews took this literally. And so uh, an Orthodox Jew, an Orthodox Jew would, from his headband, would hang a frontlet or a phylactery, a frontlet or a phylactery. It was a little box that was tied that would come right here in his forehead and there would be passages from Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 11, Exodus chapter 12, and Exodus chapter 3 in that little box and that little box would be right here every morning. And then they had a mezuzah, uh, which is a, a little... Um, it's a small container or a, 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 a little post with a, a container in it that was on the doorpost of their home. It was written inside of that was this text. And it was on the upper one third of the post and it was uh, cantilevered toward the inside of the house. And so that every time you walked in your house, you acknowledged the mezuzah. You acknowledged the reality that this, in this household, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We're going to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. 
This uh, text is called the Shema. It was recited every day by the Jewish faithful. And what it says is this, that if in our household and in our families, it, this is what is core and this is what is central, there is one central critical truth for families, and that is that we love God with all we are. That we love God with all we are. Verse 1 says it's a command that we love God with all that we are. The Lord is one, he says here, he is one God who expresses himself in three persons. Uh, let me just, uh, uh, as an aside, say that there are many false teachers who arise who try to deny the Trinity. Here we see the Lord our God is one, but he expresses himself in three persons. Uh, what he's saying, he is one in every and all circumstances. He is the foundation. He is the wellspring of wisdom, the trumpet of truth, the pinnacle of perception, and he contains the entirety of knowledge. He is one. He is writing to a people who are going to be tempted to follow their neighborhood gods, the gods of Marduk, Baal, and Shemosh. And just like they were enticed to follow Marduk, Baal, and Shemosh, we are enticed to follow the gods of our world, money, recognition, tolerance, and we are invited and enticed to follow some god other than the one true god. He is due our singular love. We're to love God with all that we are. We're to love God. We're to relate to Him, not according to our covenant treaty, but we're to love God. It isn't because they were Jewish and they had a tr covenant treaty with God. It was because God was their God and they were in relationship with Him and they were to love Him. And that is what we ground and found our household, our families, our lives upon. We're to love Him in a distinct way with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. We're to love Him with a sincere love, not in word only, but springing from our heart. We're to love Him with an entire love from our soul, not a hollow love. We're to love Him with a strong love, with all of our might, all of our ardor, all of our fervency. We're to love Him with all of our strength. We are to love Him with a superlative love, with all, with all, with all. We hear it over and over. We're to love Him with all, with all, with all. A.W. Tozer said this, we're called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. We are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. Gary Oliver said it this way in his parenting book. He said, our primary call as, uh, as parents, our primary call isn't to be good parents. Our primary call is to model a vibrant and vital love relationship with the living God. And parents, if you, if you model a vibrant and, a, and, a, and, and vital love relationship with the living God, that's the best gift you can give your children, and that's the healthiest your family can ever be. Here in our text, he says we're to teach that kind of singular love in our household. We're to teach these words to our children. How you doing, Micah? You're going to need both services? Okay. Hey, brother, I believe in you. Stay the course. Stay the course. Okay, I'm coming back to you in a minute here. We're to teach that kind of singular love to our children. We're to continually invest in them the truths. One percent of a child's life is, is spent, one percent of the child's life, if, they're, if they never miss a Sunday, one percent of a child's life is spent in Sunday school. We get children 1% of the time to invest in their lives as a church, 1%. 7% of a child's life is spent in public schools. 92% of a child's life is spent in your home, 92%. And if, if you're going to invest in there, if we're teaching them, and what is it that we're teaching them? This is what's critical. We, the, we teach our children a singular love of God, a unique and profound love of God. We are to, instructed to build a foundation of godliness in our home. He says we're to teach diligently everywhere. When we, walk, when we sit down, when we rise up, we're just continually to be pointing them to a relationship with God. It needs to be consistent and we need to be always alert and focused on the task and the investing on our children. Now, some of you will have no clue who George Brett is, but George Brett, let me tell you, George Brett was a third baseman for the Kansas City Royals of some notoriety. Okay, I know before your time, George Brett. Okay, George Brett 
on, uh, on a stellar day. He had a four, uh, four-hit day. On his fourth hit, he, he surpassed uh, uh, an incredible milestone in major leagues, and that was his 3,000th hit. 3,000th hit. Only 18 other major leaguers had done that in the history of, of ball at that time in, uh, in George Brett's experience. And so he's on first base talking to the first baseman about 3,000 hits and enjoying the day. And do you know what happened next? Some of you know what happened next. Do you know what happened next? He got picked off. He was put out. Because he wasn't paying attention. He was in the midst of the game. He was trying to help the team. But he was basking in the moment and he wasn't paying attention. And it's hard to stay focused at all times. Do you know, if you talk to your children in the morning, in the evening, and at the three meals, that's five times a day, and you do that every day, and uh, you do that every day for 18 years of their lives, do you know how many, uh, how, how many moments of investing in God's, God's nature, God's truth, and God's counsel you have given them in their lifetime in 18 years? You want to guess what number that is? 32,850. Is it very tough to draw 35 circles? That's five times. That's, that's given a week of devotion to God and five investments in their life. Overly tough, Keelan? Not too tough? Not too tough. You know, for a week, we can do well. But oh my goodness, to consistently and sincerely and with focus invest how many how many did you get so far micah <laughs> thank you brother you can go sit with your bride you can go sit with your bride thank you hey brother thanks for helping me man Keelan, thanks for helping me bro man it's not easy or simple to consistently teach and invest and stay focused on the truths of God in our homes. It's just critical. It's just life and death. It's just formative. We're to do that diligently. We're to do that intentionally. Verse 7 says, we're to teach our children. And the word, the Hebrew word here for teach is a word that literally could be translated sharpen. We're to sharpen our children, meaning that we're to put a razor edge in their life about how they relate to this world and how they know what to do. We're to teach our children. We're to teach them relationally. We're to, we're to teach those that God has blessed into our lives and, and, and we're to welcome them into our lives. God, God didn't make a mistake when He gave you the children He gave you. I, I understand sometimes you think, oh my goodness, but I don't know. <clears throat> do you remember, those of you who are married, do you remember when you got married? Did God use your spouse as a, an instructive truth in your life and in your world? Yes. And you got adjusted and got around that, and then what happened? Kids came. And you know what? I am astounded if you have more than one kid. I am astounded that you can put together the same DNA, and those kids come out, and they are night and day different. You just think, what in the world? Where did this one come from? Straight from God, straight into your life, to teach you, for you to teach them. God purposed this relationship. We're to teach ingeniously, we're to capture every moment. It's supposed to be the reality of, hey, while we're walking as we're living, this is how God impacts our world every day. It's just, it's just natural. We, we need to do that, we need to do that purposefully in the day. We need to teach according to the rhythm of our lives. 
as, as, we, as we walk about just doing life, we're to teach visually. He says in verses 18, keep it before your eyes, keep it before your eyes. Your family, because your family, family, family is precious. Family matters, family is dear. Paris Opera House, famous singer got laryngitis and a new performer with great promise had to stand in at the last moment. Everyone had come expecting to see the primo singer and instead they got the stand in up and comer. And he sang the first song with excellence and it was met with icy silence in the crowd until from an upper balcony you heard a, an excited little kid's voice, Daddy, I think you were wonderful. Applause broke out throughout. Who can measure the treasure that family is? And our faith is something we should communicate in family. It should be the heart of our home. Now in the scripture, Hezekiah, king of Judah, was visited by the Babylonians, and he showed them all he had. And Isaiah came to him and he said, What have you shown them? And he said, what did they see in your house? What did they see in your house? And he said, I showed them everything. And that's an interesting question. What do we see in our house? And if you've been taking a nap, I want to wake up right now. I want to invite you to wake up. Because I got six things I think that they need to see in your house. I don't want you to miss those. Because I think they're significant. Number one, they got to see love there. Love must be there. Proverbs 27, verse 5. You not need to write that one down. You need to commit that to memory. In Proverbs 27, verse 5, the Bible says this. Better is open rebuke than love that's concealed. Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. If you love people and you walk with them in a love relationship and you're just kind of not comfortable with expressing emotion and not comfortable with sharing heart and so you don't say anything. The Word of God says it's better that you walk up to the person you love and slap them. Give them some open rebuke. Slap them upside the face. That's better than burying the love that you have for them. That's not what Pastor Paul said. That's what the Word of God says, guys. So let me encourage you, in your household, let there be open, clear, expressive love. Jesus loved us profoundly. There was no mistake in it. There needs to be no mistake in it in your household. Speak it often, speak it sincerely, speak it from your soul. Love openly. Love must be there. Number two. God made individuals and he placed individuals into your household. Make sure you make space for individuals. Your children are not little clones of who you are. Every once in a while, just to spite you, God gives you a clone of who you are and it will irritate the fire out of you. But your children, your children are fearfully and wonderfully made. God wove them together while they were in their mother's womb, and he numbered their days before there was one of them. He has a purpose and a plan on each of their lives. That's Psalm 139. You've got to live with Psalm 139. And so in your household, in your household, make place for the unique, the individuality of your child, and draw out from that child what God has placed within that child, because every child has a sweet spot in their life. Every child has that area, that realm in life that works for them, that animates them, that empowers them, that fires them. And let that be. Let it be. When our boys were young, one of the things we continually did is we prayed, God, God, help us to recognize, help us to see that one thing. Help us to see that one thing that fires them, well, that one thing that energizes them, that one thing that encourages them. When, when Josh was younger, he loved playing trumpet. He loved playing trumpet. And so, so as a middle schooler, we had a high schooler who was so gracious, and then college student who was so gracious. Uh, Chris Weddle was willing to give our son trumpet lessons. Man, oh man that <clears throat> until you have a junior high kid, you don't know what a miracle that is, okay? 
junior high children, my wife just continually told me, Paul, just remember, you're not good with junior high kids. Just remember. That was my caution. To smile and walk away many times, okay? And that young man poured into our son, and I, and, and I was so thankful for that. I, I was so frustrated when the a band instructor decided, we've got to have a throwdown. You can't do football and do band. And I thought, are you brain damaged? What are you saying? What are you saying? Find that one thing. What is it? What is it? Don't force them into what is your one thing. What is it? And let them flourish there. Let them blossom and grow there. It's what God created them to be and do. It's your job to help identify that in their lives. You've got to help them identify that which God wove into their, into their life so that they can use that in furthering the kingdom. And if it's sports, then support them all that you are. If it's, if it's, if it's instrumental music, then support them all that you are. If it's whatever it is. What, is, what animates that child? You've got to discover that, number three. Rules and boundaries are understood in families. Rules and, bounds, rules and boundaries are found there. What, what, do they find, what they find in your house? They found rules and boundaries there. The Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. Foolishness, the Bible says, foolishness in the book of Proverbs, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline removes it far from him. You've got to have discipline. If you're going to have a, a healthy, happy home, Stepdad was trying to, trying to build relationship with stepson, and man, oh man, it was challenging. He would get him this and get him that, but oh my gosh, it was tough. And finally, they were on a hike, and as they were on this hike, all of a sudden, stepdad saw floating in this pool in the river the boy's ball cap. He was terrified, dove in, swam, dived, dove down, swam, dove, dove down, looking, searching desperately until he was just exhausted, pulled himself out on the bank, just exhausted, and then he saw the boy standing behind a tree. And he gave him a spanking unlike any ever spanking ever been given to any child in this world. And they went back to the car. And as they were going back, he felt a little hand in his. And they held hands. And that little guy says, the dad turned to him and said, son, why'd you do that? He said, dad, I don't know if you love me. All my buddies, their dad spanked them. I didn't know if you loved me. Now, I know that's an extreme thing, and I know not every discipline is spanking. I understand that. Okay, come on, come on. Let's, let's get to the heart of the issue. There's correction. There's boundaries. I'm going to tell you, People who love you give you boundaries. It isn't loving to just say, I'm not involved, throw your hands up, and step back and be disengaged. I'm going to tell you, that isn't loving. Loving walks into your world where you are and lives with boundaries. Number four, problems are openly and honestly discussed and addressed. Problems are openly and honestly discussed and addressed. There aren't secrets in a family. We just talk. Number five, we're committed to the process, not to the moment. We're committed to the process, not the moment. When you're in a family, this is what it is. I'm all in for all of life, no matter what. The whole, the whole process, the whole journey. Number six, it's where Jesus is the head of everything. He is the head of all involved. Verses 10 through 15, he says we need to beware lest we forget. When everything's going right and good, we have a tendency to forget. When everything is going wrong, we have a tendency to forget. We need to pay attention lest we forget. Because our God is a jealous God. He desires the very best for us. And the very best for us is an absolute love of Him. And the very best for us is when we walk faithfully after Him. God's design is family. It makes life best. This week, uh, I was digging through some stuff and throwing away some things. I was digging through some old files and, 
and refiling some things, keeping the things I wanted to keep and uh, uh, disappearing some things. And I ran across a note that I'd scratched down of something one of our preschoolers had said. Her name was Velissa Downing. It had happened about 25 or 30 years ago now. But Velissa had, had spoken, and I wrote this down. She had spoken to her mommy, Jolene, and she said, Mommy, thank you for bringing me into this world. I sure am having fun so far. That's what family's about. Finding the will of God. Delighting in the will of God. And experiencing the wonder. God created family. I wish every family was perfect. Thanks, Brian. There's not one in Scripture. Yours won't be either. But the great challenge is just to continually pursue and continually refine and continually walk after his heart. And it will make all of us more and more in the image of the living God. Our musicians are going to come. We're going to sing our hymn of decision.